my name is Maurice Washington. I want to welcome everybody to another episode of Executive Talk. Please make sure that if you're watching on TV, make sure that you know that you can tune in live on Facebook and also on YouTube. On those two platforms, those are platforms that we can use to actually keep the conversation going. So if you have any questions or anything that pops out to you that you would like to converse about, please make sure that you utilize those platforms to communicate with us and we'll keep the conversation going. You're right in the middle of part three of the series called Change the Character to Find Success. I really encourage you to go ahead and take a look at the part one and part two to make sure that you can consume all of this all at one time to make sure that everything that we're talking about makes sense to you. It's very easy to come into this particular conversation and you'll, you'll pick up some nuggets, but all these, all these uh, shows, we're building up a conversation. So again, I encourage you to make sure that you're in tune with everything that's going on. In today's show, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna break up the show title and we'll talk about the change of character. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the character initially. So why is that important? Again, in the last show, we talked about character and how it actually influences the work environment, you as a leader, and also employees that you have. It all matters and it all makes sense at the grand scheme of things on your day-to-day -day building of success and on, on, on your journey. You ask yourself, why am I having so many challenges within um, my company? What is going on? One thing that we, again, have taken for granted is character. How important is it? Does it matter anymore? Or is it, about, is it about money? Where are we at as a society? Where are we as, as business owners? Where are we at specifically as people? And that's what we're addressing. And this is what I feel like the Lord has me, has me addressing. So in one of our, in our last show, what we had discussed is we talked about physical signs of toxic work environment. Now, as we jump into character and we build on this, I wanna really touch, touch base on what the physical signs of this toxic environment and the physical signs of what it actually does to your character when you're in a, a characterless environment. How are you sleeping? These are some of the litmus tests that they're asking, and this, we got this from topresume.com, just so you can take a look at it. Are you regularly getting at least eight hours? What's your eating like? Are you too stressed to eat or overeat? Do you feel safe at home or, or at work? These are some of the feelings that people start to have. Now, why am I talking about feelings and character? Okay, it will, it will make sense in a second here. So if you start to have these type of feelings and you start to have these reactions, these physical signs to a work environment, what's being attacked? Workplace signs of a toxic environment. Employee sickness. Toxic workplaces lead to employee burnout, fatigue, and illness due to high levels of stress. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever found a happy, stressed person? I want you to think about that. We, we joke about it. We say, no, this is good stress. This is, this is good stress to have. Is your character going to be at its optimum level if you're operating from a place of stress? Is your character going to be at an optimum level if you're not getting enough sleep? If you're not eating right? If you don't feel safe at home or for, at work? If you're having these issues at home and work, what do you think is happening to your character? Are you coming in with full faith and trust and strength? Or, if you're, or are you nervous and worried because you have to go to work? Do you dread going to work in the morning? Do you try to sleep in a little bit longer because you think that's going to make getting you to work quicker okay those are all symptoms that you're going through right now in order to get through your day but it's doing something to your character It's changing you inside narcissistic leadership your higher-ups demand that you always agree with them tell them that they're right and feel that they're above the rules so somebody has to lose in this battle when you're operating in this type of environment, somebody has to lose. More than likely, your employees have to, based on this, this is an employee reaction to the leadership that they're under. So within this, a, one character has to actually be higher up than the, than the other character. That means somebody else's character is more important than yours. This actually becomes a consumption of the, of the office space. It's because if I have to decrease my character in order for you to feel better about yourself, 
then that's an oppressive, narcissistic environment. That's what we're going through, and that's what we're talking about when it comes to your character. If you start to have these feelings and you have to do these things in order to get along and move along in your office space, you have compromised already your character. Little to no enthusiasm. Look around the office space. Is anyone happy to be working there? Is anyone smiling? Are conversations positive and upbeat? Now, you say, well, why would conversations be upbeat when we're at work? That's a crazy question, Maurice. Well, why shouldn't it be? If you're going to spend the majority of your time there, why should, your, why, should you, why should your emotions be lower? Why should you dread going to work when your work is actually paying for the majority of your bills? Let's think about how that works out. The fact that there's little to no enthusiasm means that you have a heart condition based on where you're going. You have taken for granted as an employee and also as an owner what that work environment means to your day-to-day -day life. It has a major part of where you're at and how you're actually able to function. But we get to the point where we're saying, well, well whatever. I just got to do this job. I can't wait for Friday. It's Monday, but man, I can't wait for Friday. So that means you get to skip over the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and just jump to Friday. That's how emotional it is that we have to get to in order to get along in this day to day. What kind of character are we operating in if we forget about the moment, if, if we forget about today? Is that high character? Lack of or negative communication. You and others don't know, get the necessary information to do your job. You work hard with no positive feedback and no recognition. And you might even be told you'd be glad to have a job at all. Taking people for granted. Where have we gone as a society where we have gotten to the point where it is okay to take people for granted? Do you know how much communication I may need? This is one of the things that we're learning about society is that when, you, when you're not operating on a high level of character, you're not able to communicate on a very high level. That means that you're not really understanding relationships and how people need to operate. Communication is the thing that gets me through. Because let's say we didn't talk for, actually, let's just, let's just do a, a scenario with you and I right here. Yeah, me and you. So we're doing this scenario, and I met you before, and I said, work for me. Okay, that's the deal. So then you're in my office, I talk to you every day and let you know what's going on. And then for a month, that following month, I don't communicate with you anymore as to what's going on. Because I feel like, I feel like I've gave you enough co communication for you to be flexible in doing your job. But we don't, we stop communicating. Didn't I train a communication pattern with you and then all of a sudden I took it away? Okay, now I've actually taken just that quick, as soon as we stop communicating, I've taken what we started for granted. And now we're out of alignment. So what happens to, what happens to people when you stop this communication? It makes me feel insecure. It makes me feel like, man, where's my place in here? I mean, I felt really comfortable because you're feeding me with this communication, but now that we're not here, I don't even know if, I, I, should I have this job? Do I feel comfortable anymore? It starts to mess with my character because now I don't feel secure anymore with what we had discussed. High turnover. When the work environment has nothing good to offer except dysfunction, poor morale, and sickness, people will start heading for the door to find a better situation. If you notice a high turnover rate in your company or department, take that as a sign of a toxic workplace. Now, let's look at that real quick. Let's look at some of these three different things that they mentioned here. They said dysfunction, poor morale, and sickness. How can you operate off a of good character with dysfunction? Do you, do, does that make you reach higher? No, if there's enough dysfunction around, you start to conform to the environment that you're in. You start to get used to it. And we had talked about earlier, when you start getting used to, well, I got to go back to work. You know, this thing, huh, I can't believe it. But you're able to put gas in your car. 
But you know what, man, I got to go ahead and get back to work. And this place is just, oh, just, just wears me out. You're operating off of dysfunction. Is that high character? Ask yourself that. Poor morale. That means we're not working together. That means when I see you in the office space and I come in and let's say you're my, you're my employee, you're looking at me a certain way and I'm looking at you a certain way, like please don't talk to me because let's just get this job done so we can go back home in our separate ways. We're off of poor morale right now. <clears throat> in sickness. If I find myself going through this sickness, that means something internally is happening to me. I'm off balance. There's one thing when the season changes, yeah, I understand that sickness, but there's something when you're constantly going to work and you're constantly, sometimes you're good and sometimes you're not good and you're not sick. There, there's something that your body is responding to. It's a toxicity that's happening to you. So how does the enemy work? How is he, why does he go off of this? Because if I can defile you, it's a level, a level of defilement. I need to, if I was an enemy, I'm going to attack your character. I'm going to make you operate at a lower level. Because if I can operate, have you operate at a lower level, that means my message as the enemy can control the office space. I can actually create gossip. I can actually, as the enemy, create clicks, gossip, and rumors. You know how clicks are in the office space. Oh, well, you know, we're the only group that actually works here, so we'll, we'll, we'll just join up together. See, that group over there, is, they just rarely get anything done. I can't believe they still work here. See, now we're in the battle of the office space as to who's better in the same office space. What did I just create in that scenario? I created a level of division. So no longer is the office standing together. But everyone seems to be out for themselves. And there are no genuine friendships among employees. There's a lots of infighting, paranoia, as well as gossip and rumors. You know, gossip and rumors, they can destroy a person. You know, I just happened to have an opportunity to be at a conference not too long ago and just hear some of the challenges people have gone through based off of gossips alone. And it can destroy your character and run so fast because it's a movement that's beyond you. And so this whole thing about gossip and rumors, it is huge. And again, it is very toxic. And, but it, the gossip doesn't really hurt the flesh of a person. It hurts the character. It hurts the movement of the person. Now, it was interesting. As I was doing this show, the Lord actually sent me to this because we're actually used to this. We're used to this kind of character issue, and I'm going to explain it to you after I read this verse to you. Let me go ahead and explain. James 4.2 reads, You crave what you do not have. You kill and covet, but you're unable to obtain. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. And when you ask, you ask, with the, you ask to receive. Because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may squander it on your own pleasures. Let me go ahead and create a scenario for you as to how long ago we've actually are used to this particular verse. Have you ever been, well, actually as, as a child, you remember that moment when, I don't know, you wanted your favorite, uh, for guys, you wanted your WWE character, okay? You wanted a little toy so you can play with it. Well, when your parents said no, how quick did you let it go? probably didn't let it go very easily because you wanted it. You knew specifically that's where you wanted to go and that was your aim. Have you ever just kept on asking for it and kept on sending subtle hits, hits to, your, to your mother and to your father? Hey, you know, I'd probably, be, I'd probably have a really good day if I had that toy. You know, I need that toy now for Christmas. Is Christmas coming up? Is it here? Oh, I think my birthday's coming up. Um, I, you know, I need that. See, there's something that's in us that's actually trained and we're operating this operating, operating off of our flesh. And so when our flesh is operating for us, what's going on is we're craving something. It defiles our, it starts to defile our character. So I want you to think about when the office space, both employer and employee are seeking something. 
And typically we're operating off of this. So if you, if I want something, if I want a day off, if I need an extra, if I need a little of this and I don't receive it, this scripture right here starts to, starts to just run in me. I start to operate in, again, this is how this, how this stuff actually starts to stick and it's hard to really control. Because if I'm operating off this scripture, I want you to hear how devastating this is. You kill and covet. Isn't that one of those, isn't that one of the top uh, 10 commandments? Once you start coveting, then you're never happy. Because I want that, and I want that, and guess what? I want that too. Okay, so I'm coveting. But I will slander you, I will gossip about you because I'm coveting. And so right now, we're off balance, and that's all it takes for the enemy to actually insert this scripture into the base, into the base of your, of your office space. Which, let me ask you this, are you operating off a of high character if this is how you're being? Not at all. Not at all. This stuff starts to be get, become embedded into your lifestyle. You start to operate with it everywhere. You don't just do it at the office. You do it at home, and this is just a way of being. It's a way of life. The toxicity, the creative thing is the office space. I want you guys to take that, take that into, into, into your spirit for a minute. If I was unhappy about my life and I thought money was going to be the scenario that was going to save me, and I'm coveting money, and I'm going to try to figure out how to get this, okay, and I figure out business ownership is the best way to get it, I'm already started my business off a place of coveting. I'm coveting money because that has given me a way out as to what, how I can get out of my personal situation. So I'm going to create this thing, which is an office space, and I know if I hire people to actually help hire me or help get the money that I'm searching for, I can, I can get this thing done. Well, the toxicity is the way that you came into it. You came into it, we came into it because we're coveting. That was the base of how we developed this um, about this company. So then we create that source, which is the office space, and then now we here we are with people. And people don't that people that have challenges understanding relationships and how it really works with people, we do so much damage to each other. It's not even it's not even funny. So let's talk about the consumption of glory with that thought being said. The owner and the employees. Which one's right? Well, the owner's coming into the office. Well, this is my agency. This is my company. I need to make sure that I get what I need. I got to make sure that our brand is right. I have to make sure we're doing all this. I have to make sure that you get paid. So this is why I'm telling you to do this. I have to make sure that I have these conversations. And when everything changes, I have to make sure I have to, I have to, I have to. The employees say, you know what? I got to come in here. And I have to make sure that this works, and I have to make sure that I get this to you on time, because if you don't get it, you're going to be upset with me, but I have to make sure that I get my PTO, and I get my time off, and I get this. In that scenario, yes, Maurice, you're giving me a scenario. Where, is this, where are you going with this? At what point did I give God the glory? Who is the glory on? Did you notice in both scenarios that I gave you, I kept on saying, I have to, I have to, I have to. So who am I glorifying? I'm making sure as an owner, when I communicate to you, I, I got to make sure that I'm glorifying myself. You need to provide me this so I can do this. The employees are saying, you need to provide me this so I can do this. So there's a level in this glorification, we're asking for fairness. So that means if there's a level of fairness that's happening, are we, it, and what is fairness? We're gonna talk about that in our, in our next show. But there's a consumption of glory. Every, the owner and the employees are just worried about themselves and where they're trying to go. Now, of course, we're, we're so sweet as people. <laughs> we're not gonna sit here and say, no, I'm not a nice person. I try to give everything I can to everybody. But then we don't hear ourselves talk when we say, I, I need this, I need this, I need, I need. 
who are we glorifying? Ourselves. So no longer is this office space specifically set up to go for, for, for God's principles. It's for our own principles. So in this scenario, I want to ask you a quick question. Let me go back to it so that way you guys can see it here. Whose responsibility is this? Is it the owner's responsibility? Is it the employee's responsibility? I mean, who, who's at fault? Because both, both, both parties are going to say, well, if you did, this is now we get, now we get on selfish at this stage. This is our, our, our overriding character. Well, if you did this, well, then I wouldn't have done this. We're still in that glory struggle. But ultimately, this, this responsibility comes with the owner. The character and the culture of the organization has everything to do with the owner in owning that character and how the company responds. That's why it's so important for the owner to actually lead. So when you, when you think about ownership, you're thinking about leadership. You are taking the ability to lead people into the right direction, to take a bad character, to take a moment and look at that and make a, make a specific decision that leads them back into good character. But if the owner here is the leader and has the character of I, well, as an employee, I'm going to mirror, and as we saw in the last show when we talk about sheep, I am going to mirror the leader sheep, whatever that is and whoever that is. So you can sit here and say, well, my employees are just, they, all they do is they don't even know what's going on with me, what I, what I have to go through. Guess what employees are saying at home? The owner has no idea what I have to go through in, in order to get through this office space. Jeez, guess what? The same conversation is resounding. We at our crossroads because nobody's taking ownership of what the issue is, and there's a character culture issue within your office space. Important message for leaders. When you operate in idolatry, you will always be the victim and lean towards money to find the solution. Because the easy out of this thing, and the one thing that the enemy creates in this character change, or in this character, is money will solve it. Money will free up this. Money will get us towards where we need to go, because no, 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 no. Now you're in a, now you're in a hamster wheel because you're dealing with something that can never be satisfied. Because you have more money now, that quiets down the environment for a little while. We all know how it works. But then again, the feeling of character is still there. The culture is still there. It doesn't take much. Now, it comes back to solution finding. Change, okay? And if you've been following me for a while, one of the, sh one of the Resounding things I'm always going to talk about and the Lord has me talking about is repentance. But we call this change. Does the, does the Bible say change? Does it, does it, does it say that? No, it actually, it's actually it's the most powerful word and the most disturbing word to our flesh. Change is not disturbing to our flesh. I don't mind changing directions because I'm going to, as long as it goes the right way. But when you ask me to repent, uh, what do you mean? Because if I repent, that means that the scriptures have got to change everything and then change the culture of how I see things. That's where the challenge becomes, and so it's not changing. Can you repent? Are you bold enough to address your stronghold, leaders, and also employees? But as a responsibility component, we're going to talk about everybody's there, but from the owner's perspective, are you willing to address this statement? And as, you, as you've witnessed, and as you saw in the last few shows, we talk about the strong will, this is who I am. It's the most dangerous statement that you have going for your whole life. This is who I am. As business owners, if, because repentance, this, this, this repentance is change that we call it, but what it is, this repentance, is going to address this first. Because what you created is not who you are. You're looking at it through the lens of God's eyes, not yours. This, as long as you allow this to be addressed, 
we can find some we can find a solution to your office. This is who I am. Really think about that. How often do you say that? You know, it's very easy to say, you know, I've been through changes. I've I, I, I don't I do some things I don't used to do. I, I don't used to do anymore. Doesn't matter because you can choose something else to replace that thing, and you haven't gone anywhere. A repentance is a complete 360 direction. There is an absolute difference. What makes this so hard is that the flesh, all your in order to actually maintain some of our bad character, our poor character behavior in those moments, there has to be a commitment, there has to be a trust in it, there has to be a love for it, and there has to be a faith for what it's going to produce. What makes us weird as people, and yes, we are weird, is that when we're operating in the flesh and we have something that's completely defeating us and we keep on trying to pursue it, I want you to think about that. The office space is telling you that it's a toxic environment and you're not immune to it. You know it. You know your employees are stressing you out. You know the employees are stressed out. But we keep on committing to the same movement and we haven't changed the behavior. We haven't repented from the behavior. And it's hard because the commitment and trust and faith and the love of the flesh, even though it will destroy us, is that strong. That's why repentance is the only way to actually start to change this behavior because we won't realize the strength it takes and how much commitment and love and trust that you have of the flesh until you actually operate in the Bible. It is astronomical. In this next show, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about Jesus' character. Okay? Why did he, why did he die for our, for our sin? Did he die for our character issues? the character issues that flesh has, has created for us. We're going to talk about that in the next show, and really, we're going to really dive into the success component of it. Because, yes, I know that's what you guys are here for is because we, we, we love that word success, but this is all about a, a, a matching environment of not only, again, it's about the character, but it's also about matching both character and success. I want to make sure that you guys stay in tune with this show. We are on to something here, and this is going to be very impactful. But I thank you guys for tuning in today. Catch us live on Facebook and also on YouTube. But in the meantime, I actually have to get back to work. Thank you guys so much for your time. <laughs>